Good evening, I'm Isaac Benezra, host and co-producer of Conversations. It's good to be with you for another week of interesting chatter. I have with me Nick Seaman, who's well known, the owner of Black Sheep on Main Street. And we're gonna get right into why Nick's here. Nick, first of all, good to see you. Thanks, Ben. Isaac. Either way. Either way. Either way, you can't lose. That's okay. <laughs> if you call me Ezra, I have, actually I've got three names. Okay, good. <laughs> um, I need to complicate things. Yeah, sure. Right. Nick, only no middle initial. Nope, no middle name. Just nope. Nick, good, good old Nick yep, Seaman. Yep. My parents, no middle names for me and Nick, my brother. You've been here since 1980, at least. Well, 75. 75. I got here. Yeah. But you started Black Sheep. 86. In 86, that's what I was thinking of, with your wife, that's of right. course. And uh, tell me what's on your mind. Well, the issue of the day is uh, what's happening at UMass, and we're having difficulty with them because they seem to be wanting to keep every dollar on campus. And on the surface, there's nothing wrong with that, except that they're a public institution, which means they're using public tax dollars to compete with us. So the, t the two or three problems that we're having are, number one, University is denying us, meaning local businesses, caterers, restaurants, access to our traditional catering customers that we've had forever um, via memos and uh, uh, policies coming down from the uh, Vice Chancellor of Administration and Finances Office. Um, and secondly, they are leaving campus to cater. So they're not only working on campus, but they're leaving campus to cater into, in our territory. So they're denying us access to bi our traditional business on campus, but coming on into our turf to, ca to compete against us, using our tax dollars to compete against us. So it, whether it's technically legal by the letter of the law, it seems wrong. And be, prior to uh, 2005 or 2007, what was the pattern? Well, we all, you know, speaking for myself and a couple other caterers in town, we always had some big jobs on campus. Catering being defined as, you know, a job where we provided staff. You know, an end of the year big party for a department or a, a, a retirement party or a uh, some big event in one of the departments. We can no longer do that. No catering in, on campus, only university campus, university dining services. Um, uh, and then even large deliveries have been limited by uh, these memos and these policies. So, and what did the memo say? Well, the, the problem with the memo, the first one that we saw from 2007 from uh, Joyce Hatch, the Vice Chancellor of Administration and Finance, said... You know, dear department head at the university, you know, to assure that your food is safe um, and, you know, to provide all safety, you know, necessary safety issues, you know, we are asking or requiring you to use on-campus catering services. We took, you know, kind of umbrage with that because we, we were wondering what was the problem with our food. You know, we're inspected by the Amherst Health Department, um, and I've asked the university for specific instances or reasons why they think our food isn't as safe as the universities, we've never gotten an answer. So you, have, you, you use the word required. That's strong language. You want to spell that out a little more? Do they, they, that, that, that would be interpreted to yeah. say, you're free to do whatever you want, but we strongly advise you to use our program. Yeah, well, there are a little... the implications? Uh, the implications are we're, we really are not allowed on campus anymore to cater an event. I mean, they need permission and a, what's called a waiver. If you run the biology department, English department, chemistry department, and you want to have some big event at, that requires staff, and you don't want to use UMass catering, you have to, according to them, get a waiver. But the last round of emails I saw between my friend Raphael at Portobello Catering and this gentleman, Administration of Finance, he, the, this gentleman said, uh, you'd have to get a waiver to work on campus, but we're not given any. You know, so uh, UMass Catering can handle it all. Um, 
So we're being denied, you know, we're slowly, the, 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 circ, the uh, area of business that we're allowed to deal with on campus is getting smaller and smaller. Um, this is a big business. The auxiliary services, which is the uh, group on, the institution on campus that runs all the food, I think they run the hotel, off-campus catering, uh, the truck, you know, this thing called the Mini Burke, which runs around this $150,000 truck they bought with your dollars and mine. Um, auxiliary services grossed $66 million last year. They are a behemoth. They're huge. And uh, it's hard to compete against that. So the argument for you in terms of somebody who's uh, operating a small business in town, paying taxes, keeping the downtown vital, which is not unimportant right. because there are the after hours and the in-between hours where people mix, where the community blends, where we, we see kids coming in with their computers and not kids, right. older students and sometimes faculty. And so that there's a, 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 it's, a, it's, a it's part of the community niceties that we've established in in communities like Amherst, to be mm -hmm. able to do business, to, to serve everybody. That's being negated, that's being depleted somewhat, or are you still doing very well? Well, you know, we are pr reasonably busy, but we, as UMass grows, we're, and they are growing like crazy. I can't believe how much building is going on over there and how many new beds they're gonna have and, or how many more people they're gonna admit without beds that are gonna be living in downtown. And I think they see dollar signs, you know, and the thing is, that you have to understand is it's not just food. It's uh, copying textbooks. I think wherever they see money to be made, they're trying to, starting to deny. Um, if you interviewed professors at UMass, you'd find out that they're being told, please, you, you know, please use or you're required to use, I don't know the language, uh, you know, UMass printing and copying and not any downtown. Copy shops. And, and in terms of textbooks, we've seen the decrease of sales of textbooks. Absolutely. At uh, Food for Thought and other areas. Oh, and Amherst Books. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's a problem. They're half the uh, population of the town. Uh, where, where's the, uh, the equity in terms of negotiating a solution to this? To really what do you <laughs> see? It seems like it's a David versus a Goliath. Yeah, well, we were talking about that earlier. I think that, um, you know, our little group of downtown players met with our state rep, uh, the town manager, the head of the chamber last fall, which is how many months ago, nine months ago. And, you know, they're having ongoing conversation with the university. Um, what we've said in, me in emails to the university is, and, what, and I, I spoke about a couple weeks ago at the Amherst Club, is that we are reserving our right to inform the Boston Globe about this, that maybe it's a public story. Let the Boston Globe interview people at UMass, find out what the hell's going on. And ultimately, and I don't think we want to go down this road, but we're reserving our right to, is hire an attorney. Because we're not really sure that everything the university is doing is legit according to the charter of the university. And I'm saying that without having really gone into it with a lawyer, so I'm, I'm being really clear about it. But um, at some point, a lawyer needs to read the charter and say, they're really supposed to be doing all this. You know, and this is not an issue of privatization where uh, companies take over formerly public institutions mm -hmm. and... and uh, uh, it's the brought, reverse, almost. This is a... <laughs> Well, well, I don't think anybody would find any fault with uh, services on campus, uh, which are traditional. Uh, the hotel, mm -hmm. uh, the, the cafeterias, the, uh, the, the, the coffee uh, spots right. and whatever. That's not issue, at issue. The issue is the right of departments, the right of students putting together an activity to be able to go into the community itself. Well, we, I think we just want a level playing field. That's right. You, you know? want to have access. We want to have access. You're not, not asking for monopoly. You want, an, you want access. Well, and at the Amherst Club, where I spoke a couple weeks ago, where you were, um, interesting comment came up. 
which was by an, uh, just a recent graduate, saying uh, she wasn't sure that it wasn't a good idea for the campus to try to make as much money as possible on food or whatever because it would help keep costs down um, if they could make more money instead of paying in the private sector. And my point on that was lack of competition, you know, monopoly, doesn't lead to lower prices. You know, uh, these departments on campus are paying a higher price for what they're getting from uh, auxiliary services than what we would charge. We're not allowed to bid on the same jobs. So if the English department, for example, only has a certain amount of budget to spend on food for a year, we can help them save money, which seems to be a good thing. And uh, do they have the adjustment capability in terms of menus? I have no idea. Uh. I have no idea. The other thing that you need to know about this is I got an interesting phone call, I think it's about a year and a half ago, from a guy, it was either in Dartmouth or Lowell, I wish I could remember, where there's another UMass campus. He had heard my name um, somewhere. And he said, or asked me, if I was having the same difficulties with UMass as he was having in his town. They were doing the same thing, which led me to believe that this was a statewide you know, policy. This wasn't just Amherst. This was UMass proper, you know, that they were looking at the bottom line and bringing in these, you know, guys, usually in suits, in these administrative departments to make money. And uh, it just smacks wrong, you know. I, like I said, I don't know the le real legal bottom line on this, but something's not right. So we're, we're, from your perspective, there's really, uh, it's not even a stalemate. Uh, it's a, a foregone conclusion that you guys are out and have been out. And turning that around, going to the elected representatives doesn't seem to be moving very fast because there are conflicting interests. Yeah. Uh, I think we're playing catch up. I mean, you know, it took us a couple of years to figure out we never saw this memo that was written in 2007 till two years ago, 2009. I think this was a policy. They put it into play. And auxiliary services, like I said, uh, uh, because of the Freedom of Information Act, I was able to get their uh, financials. Uh, my attorney told me, here's the form. You can get it. It's a public institution. You know, they grow $66 million last year. That's up to almost 20% from the year before. Uh, no one's growing by 20% in this economy. You know, they're grabbing all existing business from wherever they can grab it. And like I said, I think possibly the only thing we have to do now is call the Globe. Kind of holding back well, on that. Well, you know, you immediately happen. are going to cause a stir because this is going to reach thousands of people. And oh, God, yeah. On ACTV. You know, Thou I, how many? Hundreds? Thousands? One, two, <laughs> <Yeah>. three. <laughs> Now, word gets out. I mean, uh, going to the Amherst Club uh, is uh, uh, part of uh, letting the community know that there are complications in terms of downtown relations, yeah. and that uh, we're we're really interdependent. And when when there appears to be a grabbing of a whole sector, nobody is arguing, as I said earlier, about the usual services. It's it's suddenly, after many years of otherwise in the way of policy, denying small business people the opportunity to continue to serve. And it's a free will thing. It's, it's a, nobody makes you go anywhere, but apparently today at UMass, you're encouraged not to go anywhere else outside. Pretty much. You know, um, you know, you know maybe better than I. You know, Amherst spends a lot of money because the university is here. I mean, the the police department. You know, how large is the police department because UMass is here compared to what how, what size they would be if UMass isn't here, and who pays for that? I think we do. I'm not sure the university really funds the Amherst Police Department, but they're out there and all these off-campus parties and doing stuff. And I moved here because it's a college town. Don't get me wrong. I love it here. You know, my kids have grown, my older kids have grown up here in the high school, and I love everything that goes on at Amherst. But I think that someone ought to shine the light of day on th this um, assumed reality that UMass is good for the economy. They're the big engine here, they're the big elephant in the room. We shouldn't say anything about them. They bring jobs. 
but let's look at the details. You know, let's look at the details. I'll give you another really interesting example from last fall, which is that two or three years, I can't remember, years ago, they started something called the uh, UMass Parents Association. Um, and they called me up and said, would you give a discount to parents? And I said, yeah, knock yourself out. They get a little plastic card. They come into my store. They get a 10% discount. UMass is talking up all the people in town that give the discount. They're sending people into town. I think this is really great. So I got a call last fall, almost a year ago, from the, Amherst, the UMass Parents Association office, secretary there, saying, we've got Parents Weekend coming up. There's a 1,000 parents already registered. Would you like to come and have a table in the campus center, give out coupons, discounts, talk about your product, brochures, you know, meet parents, all this great stuff. I said, we're there. This is great. We've been after this for 25 years. Let's go. Well, it turns out that Auxiliary Services caught wind that the Parents Association did that, and we got a call the next day saying, sorry, no off-campus vendors allowed. So I felt pretty put out because I said, I'm giving a discount to your group on campus, and I can't come on campus to promote myself to your group. So they're denying us access. They are really playing hardball on campus. So what's, what's the answer in terms of, aside from trying to continue to bring this story to a wider circle, are you, are you hopeful that you can crack this, uh, this wall that's been built between you and small businesses? I guess I'm and, hopeful. And I'm town. searching for, we, we are searching for the right avenue, whether it's, you know, in the court of public opinion, in the newspapers, or whether it's legal, or, you know, I'm, I'm less hopeful that just talking to administrators will get us anywhere. I think the dollar signs are huge. So I'm not exactly sure, to tell you the truth. I, I want someone else to kind of, who's got more power than I've got, to, like, do something. That's why I'm talking about it. I mean, yeah. Maybe someone. How about the customers? They come in now. The the students, the faculty. Uh, well, the faculty that are friends of mine, I talk to. They get it because they they are feeling the squeeze. They tell me they're being told, you know, really can't use you for this, that, or the other thing. Um, we wrote a memo. You know, this is the land of the nonprofits, Amherst. You know, we get hit up for donations every day, whether it be from a nonprofit off campus or whether it be from a team. Fine Arts Center a, uh, organization on campus. So we printed a memo that I hand out to every UMass request for donation saying because UMass is trying to keep every dollar on campus and is hurting town guy relations, we have discontinued all donations to campus. Um, you know, please forward this along, this memo along to, to the, somebody. The powers that The be. powers that be. And so from, for about a year, I haven't donated anything to campus, and I did for 25 years. Fine Arts Center Gala, you know, hundreds of dollars there, and, you know, we just stopped. I'm hoping somebody, some way, will start to talk it up the chain and say, hey, you're killing us here. You know, to whoever, the, whoever writes the rules over there, I'm really a little unclear about it. I'm going to ask you uh, uh, an important question. Sure. I, I, I did it did off air earlier. Yeah. And it seems to me that the Chamber of Commerce and you're a member of the Chamber of Commerce, yeah. and so are, are some of the other co establishments that are impacted. Uh, uh, they're important in the community. Yes. To what extent, I don't know, but they still represent the, 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 the small business community. Have you brought this to them publicly? Well, yes, we have. We're, I mean, I'm encouraged. I think uh, the director of the chamber is on our side. Um, whether we have the same tactics or not, I'm not sure. But, you know, Tony is great. We love him. He's the best director so far. Uh, I've been an a, a, uh, advocate for the chamber to have a stronger voice, not only in issues like this, but at town meeting. You know, I've, I've wanted the chamber to stand up at town meeting on various issues, you name it, whatever you it have. is. I have. And said, I, want the I don't want to stand up anymore. I want the director to stand up and say, I represent 689 businesses, or whatever the hell the number is now, saying, you know, we want this or else, or whatever. You know, I don't know what the... Well, we don't like the or else. I understand. <laughs> we, like, we, we, we need to... That's one of the issues. We, when we create the or else, 
forgive me, but this yeah. is a long history. And uh, there are other points of view in the community about how, what's in the best interest of the whole community. And sometimes we don't agree on a third tier for an, uh, a, a parking place, but we wound up with two tiers. Mm -hmm. And it seems to be working pretty good. Well, you don't want to go into parking with me, but no, um, I don't want to go into parking. But you know, but if the, the point is the, the chamber is it, the reason I bring up chamber is they they your they your they're your spokesperson right. in the community. That's they, right. They represent over six hundred. Yeah, I think it's six hundred, seven hundred. I don't even and, know. And it seems to me you already have a coalition of mutual interests. Right. And so anything we could do to spur the the chamber on and give you every opportunity to express your, your legitimate concerns, we'll do. I mean, ideally, yeah. honestly, the chamber sh should be the big voice on a lot of these things, whether we win or lose or whatever, but it shouldn't be individual guys like me. You know, the chamber, that's politics, right? I mean, they're, they're a lobbyist for 700 businesses. They have some clout if, and you know, they use it where they can, but I think they don't, under yeah. I think they underestimate how much clout they've got. Well, I think they've been visible in the last few years. More and more, yeah. Very, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And that's good and bad. It depends on your perspective on what the issues are. But that's what makes the game work. That we win some, we lose some. But absolutely. But we, we find some kind of commonality to uh, bring closure to some of the issues. But, you know, the interesting thing about the chamber is um, Amherst has a lot of old lefties Maybe you and me, I don't know. Oh, who think I'm, I'm to the right or the left. You're to the right or the left, okay. Or but, I'm to the left. Of <laughs> <laughs> whatever. But, um, you know, a lot of people hear word chamber of commerce and have negative reaction to it. You know, and uh, there was one thing in the newspaper a few years ago, I immediately, about the National Chamber, I called Tony immediately and said, you know, look, we're, we're not a member of this, are we? You know, because if my dues are going to the National Chamber of Commerce, I am out. And he said, no, no, we're totally independent. You know, and what I think people in Amherst don't get is that the members of the Amherst Chamber of Commerce tend to be extremely progressive, active in the community, donate. Do it. They're not like the National Chamber of Commerce, who are lobbying for no no minimum wage and all the, no. They have never done that. So they're the, great. Amherst is the different. Re, the reality is that they're strictly local oriented. Right. And at times whether it's town meeting or on some of the bigger state issues, taxation uh, and, and uh, what's happening to the streets. And those are, that's important to the business community as well as to the, the, the families that live in town. Absolutely. So I don't think a chamber is at issue here. It's just that it is perceived as an important uh, force in the community and it could be for positive relations with the with with uh, UMass absolutely, and and there's a lot more to be done in terms of UMass town relations, and it seems to me that I, you know I'm I'm looking where, as an old lefty, as a as a, an organizer, where's your coalition? And, right, and you've got you've got you you haven't milked the one you're in yet. We're trying. Okay, but I'm I'm We're not con condemning <laughs> you. I'm just simply saying it's a hell of a start. You yeah. Know? Some of us started with five people, and That's right. we had to build an organization. Right. You've got the resources of the whole business community. Well, you know what happened with us was that years ago, I don't, you know, I'm losing track of time, in my That's old okay. age, We're 10 going. years, 12 years ago, I don't remember. Uh -huh. We went to the chamber and said, look, you really need to promote the downtown. The downtown is really the gem of the entire area. And the chamber at the time wasn't really willing to jump in for a variety of reasons. No time to go into it here. So we, a few of us, started the PDA, Promoting Downtown Amherst, which was, we told them, well, we don't want to do this. We think this is your job, but they didn't do it. So we started it. And out of the PDA, which I was the first president of, Barry Roberts, Minna Lucier, Jerry Jolly, um, what's grown out of the PDA is this business improvement district, the BID. You know, so a lot of positive things have happened. So we, I'm an old organizer. I mean, I know how to organize. And we got a lot of things done. We started an organization. We ultimately got the bid going. Jerry and Minna and, you know, Barry really took the lead on that. But um, th this whole business, uh, downtown business community issue is really big. 
You know, the, the town's budget has a lot to do with it. I don't know if you're aware of this, but um, before, since I got here in 1975, there were no malls in Hadley. It was, I don't know how long you've been here, but it was gorgeous down there. There were cows everywhere. I heard about that. It was gorgeous. And before the first mall was built, 20% of the Amherst, of Amherst's budget was generated by commercial taxes, 80% by residential. When the malls came and they started to suck the life out of the downtowns, Northampton, you know, Amherst, no more hardware stores, no more grocery stores, no more, like, you know, men's clothing, all this stuff. Um, commercial taxes in Amherst are now something like 7 or 8% of the budget instead of 20. And it's one of the big reasons why Amherst has a budget problem, is that we didn't keep up with supporting the local economy. You know, it's really changed. Well, we didn't. We, we opted out in terms of box stores. That's for one. Didn't need No one was asking we for box need, stores. We didn't need them. No, but we needed to compete, and we didn't. But but you you're dealing with box stores. That's right. That's so there was the things reality. to do. It's the bigger economy that's right. in the area that's sucking the life out. So you ha it's a constant struggle to stay to stay even even. Yeah, I just think we should have stayed with the, the current, that percentage. It would have been great for the town of Amherst. It would have been wonderful. But now we're complaining about the budget, and 93% of it comes from residential, and that's a problem. Well, that opens up a big can of worms yeah, because yeah. We, you and I could agree on a lot of other places where federal state money should be uh, focusing. Yeah. In the minute I have left, I just want to bring to the attention of our listeners that in, within the next couple of weeks, uh, the interest rate on student loans, which is around 3.9, will go to about 7% unless this wonderful Congress of ours agrees to get together. And I think they might. There's an indication that they might because the Democrats are running strong on that issue. And the so. Republicans are being caught holding the bag, and they're bitter about it, but I think we, we might see a deal. So what do we need to do? Let's help push the Republicans and negligent Democrats, wherever they may be, over the hill on this and say, we want that interest rate to remain for another semester or another year. Agreed. And with that note, I want to thank Mr. <laughs> Seaman. Good work. It was, it was, it, you did fine. And uh, thanks, thanks for having the, me. Thanks for the to the uh, student volunteers and staff, and we'll see you next week. I hope. Goodbye. Thanks.